Susan, we know in the brain that there are about 100 billion neurons in the cerebral cortex, uh, many others throughout the rest of the brain. We know we have memories and we have personality, emotion, all different kinds of things. So how do we go from one to the other? How do, how do brains work? Mm -hmm. uh, what type of relationship between all of these small little neurons, these hundred billion, how do they work together in, in to form both our memories, our consciousness, mm -hmm. all the kinds of complexity of our mental life? Okay, so let's start with when you're born, and you're born with a fair complement of brain cells. What happens is the growth of the brain for the first few years of life is characterized by the exuberant growth of connections. Hmm. So all brain cells are hooking up and um, what determines how they'll hook up are your personal experiences. But they still keep lots in reserve, which is why until you're about 10 years old, you can learn another language and still have an authentic accent. Right. Yeah? But then what happens is the brain starts to become more specialized according to your culture, your lifestyle. And there's what's called selective pruning. That's to say a cutting back of some of the connections. So gradually your brain, as you come into adolescence, is starting to be very personalized, like no other brain ever for the 100,000 years human beings mm. have stalked the planet. Finally, what happens is the frontal part of the brain, um, which is not very active initially, becomes more active in late teenage years, early 20s. And that is called the prefrontal cortex, seems to have a very interesting function. I don't think it has any one function, but what it seems to do is a, allow a cohesion to the brain because it connects to more brain areas than any other, which enables you to have more sense of sequence, of consequence, of past, present, and future. And so that's crudely, and in two seconds, how mm. the brain might develop. But if we look at how these connections are formed, um, it was one of the great discoveries several decades ago now that when a brain cell is active, how it can enforce its connections um, it's a bit like as you get to know someone, you mm -hmm. become closer right. to them. Right. The more you see the person, the closer you become. This is something called long-term potentiation, or LTP. And as its name suggests, um, it means that you have a strengthening at the level of the isolated brain cells, one with another, as they and, are more active. And this active. is at, 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 the, 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 at the, the gap in between the The gap, the the gap the between synapse. the so-called synapse, or synapse as you would say, <laughs> yeah. um, and the mechanisms are still being studied today, but this was hailed, and rightly so, as a great advance in neuroscience mm -hmm. when this mm -hmm. long-term potentiation, LTP, was discovered. Mm -hmm. So when you have the long-term potentiation between two neurons, because mm -hmm. that's where it is yeah. uh, at, at the gap, how many of these neurons in this long-term potentiation sequence are needed to make up memories or emotions or states of consciousness? How do we begin to Well, that's, that's very hard, of course. I and mean, there's, there's some great work done by someone called Eric Kandel on a plesia on snails, showing that you don't need that much, I don't mm -hmm. know the exact numbers, in order to have some crude form of mm -hmm. what we would call memory. But it mm -hmm. depends, again, what you mean mm -hmm. um, by memory. But the important issue for me is that this connectivity, these what we call hardwired networks, hardwired is actually a phrase I don't like because it implies the brain is like a computer. And my own view is that it's completely different from a computer. But let's use the word hardwired because it does get the notion of quasi-permanence, local, but slightly slow, long to form, takes a while to form. Mm -hmm. So it's slow, local, and quasi-permanent. I think there's also these neuronal assemblies, these large-scale coalitions of brain cells, which are the opposite. They're highly temporary. Oh. They're very fast, and they're global. And I think the brain works with these two types of processing. Now, this is very interesting, is that if you think about the question, why has consciousness evolved? People often ask this. I mean, for me, it's not the most burning question, but what is the point of consciousness? What is the evolutionary value? I think this could be the answer. So imagine you have a brain that has these hardwired local connections. Something comes on and it will adapt. You don't need consciousness for that. It will you know, um, adapt and strengthen by use. Yeah, um, But if you also have these assemblies, which are ways of recruiting large-scale modulatory chemicals that will predispose much larger groups of brain cells. This would mean that as you had one local adaption, you could also have more coordinated um, other adaptions as well. So you adapt to your environment in a way more holistically and globally than you would if it was just some local little connection. 
So if that was the case, the whole point of consciousness would be to enable global adaption to the environment rather than just a local kind of mechanistic um, adaption. And then the assemblies that exist transiently for less yeah. than a second, they yeah. get together and then they disperse. Mm. Do they recruit networks that are the more permanent? Yeah, let's, let's think of a stone in a puddle with the ripples being the assemblies, the stone would be the network. The stone would be the network. So you don't necessarily need a very big stone. You could have just an alarm clock and that would wake you up. But most typically, for most adult human beings, you're not the victim just of raw senses. You will be conscious of things and um, aware of things that mean something to you, that have a cognitive content. So what will happen is if you have a large stone, i.e. lots and lots of hardwired connections, that will stand more chance of triggering an assembly, a large-scale coalition of brain cells. But when it does that, this large-scale coalition of brain cells, all these modulators that are released will facilitate coordination in other areas as well. So you'll have a coordinated adaption to the environment. So does that mean that an individual network, which could refer to some specific mm -hmm. site or yeah. sound, that if that became important and entered your consciousness, what it will have had done is to recruit a larger exactly. area for that instant exactly. of consciousness. Exactly, exactly. So you wouldn't just be adapting one tiny reflex or one group of muscles. Mm -hmm. It would be adapting to the whole body and the whole context right. because you were conscious. And I'm saying that consciousness is absolutely synonymous with an assembly. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. Right. So if you are accepting the existence of the assemblies, you'll have a consciousness, which means if you're conscious, you'll adapt much more effectively and efficiently than if you don't. And that would figure because you could say animals that have much higher degrees of consciousness are much better at adaption. And of course, that's exactly the case. Human beings um, adapt much better than goldfish to life because yeah? they have deeper consciousness. Yeah.